Alright guys, welcome back to the World Championship Challenge hosted by Zelda VGC. I'm Eric and I'm back again with Lou. What is up everybody? So we are going into round two and we've got a pretty good match for you guys. We got Lightcore versus Arash and it looks like they're just going to hop right into it. So Lightcore coming in with this X-Ray squad with Mimikyu, Incineroar, Amoongus, and Tapu Fini and Arash just rocking standard Kang Torn with Incineroar instead of the usual Mawile? Uh, is, this is actually a team, I think, that got top eight recently at the uh, oh, yeah, yeah. American International Championship. Yeah, this is uh, by, Pato's version. Piloted by Flavio. Yeah, yeah Pato's version. Yeah, Flavio's OPD. Uh, turn one, we saw the fake out and taunt coming out. Standard plays by Arash uh, just to cover every option. And now we see the Z-move and Bite going into that Amoongus, which is going down but thanks to the focus sash xerneas is able to get that geomancy up it's worth noting that kangaskhan still has a potential option but fast plays here as rosh and sets the side to switch the incineroar in so it's able to take that moon blast not get o code as tailwind goes up by tornadus and the play rub doing very little damage to that physically bulky tornadus in conjunction with uh the intimidate and now we're at the point in time where tornadus is going to spam icy winds and Dazzling Gleams coming out from the Xerneas and picking up the KO on that Torn, doing hella damage to the Incineroar as it U-turns back out into Kang. With Arash basically just trying to get into the position where he can get Incineroar out. Oh, I was thinking maybe go for Incineroar so he could fake out and roar, but I mean, Gishkon's are even better, so he can go for now. The fake out Geomancy, his Xerneas, because of the Icy Winds, can also have the speed boost. He'll have a faster Xerneas. Uh, but in order for him to make that play, he's going to have to take damage from Nick's Mimikyu, uh, presumably carrying the Z-move, uh, but let's see what happens here. Yeah, we're going to see Kang go for the bite there, just trying to get the, get, try and get the, uh, try and get the flinch there on Mimikyu, but, uh, interesting that he didn't target the Xerneas with a fake out, uh, possibly predicting the Xerneas to protect. Uh, he does end up getting the flinch on Mimikyu, but at the cost of about 75%, or about 65-ish percent on his Xerneas, which is going to get... Uh, its special attack dropped by one thanks to uh, Lightcore's Moonblast. But we're just going to see the switch out into Incineroar here, likely accompanied, not accompanied by a Protect, as uh, Arash is going to go for the Dazzling Gleam, knock out Mimikyu. So the Swords Dance didn't really come into play there, as Lightcore is now going to bring out his Rayquaza, which is now facing down a low health Incineroar and Xerneas, which makes them both prime pickings for Rayquaza's extreme speed. Oh, yeah, that sword stance play actually I think was pretty important because if he didn't go for the sword stance, then Kang would just be able to fake out Xerneas as the other Xerneas Geomancy. But because it's sword stance and because it was an offensive threat, that could use the Z-move into the Xerneas. Arash was forced to have to bite to flinch it and go for the Geomancy with his own Xerneas. Otherwise, he was just going to get dominated. But in either case, uh, the Shadow Sneak probably puts this Xerneas within range of an extreme speed from Nyx Rayquaza. So he might be in a position where he has to double protect or something like that. Uh, oh, wait, oh, no, 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 I apologize. It's Norad fake out pressure. So he's the easy fake out into Rayquaza to stop it from moving. He's able to get off a Dazzling Gleam to kill the Rayquaza. But because everything was already so low, uh, Nick is able to easily finish off both Pokemon with the spread Dazzling Gleam. And it's all going to come down to if this Kang can take a Moonblast. Yeah, and Kangaskhan, usually if they're... No bulk. I mean, Kangaskhan normally has a, a tough time living uh, plus two Moonblast from Xerneas, so that's probably going to be an easy KO. Crit probably did not matter, but um, I mean, if I'm just if I'm a betting man, I'm assuming this is a not a super bulky Kangaskhan as they usually aren't. Um, just waiting for them to invite us to game two here. Here we go. Okay, I guess they're not doing all of them at once for some reason, but yeah, uh, definitely Nick's, Nick gained the advantage there by setting up his, his Xerneas early, and uh, that's sort of been a theme we've seen, seen with these games so far, is just when Xerneas, whoever sets up Xerneas first uh, tends to snowball and win the game, but um, yeah, I definitely see what you're saying about that Mimikyu play with the Swords Dance. It didn't threaten the immediate offense, it kind of just like gave up that pressure, which ended up being really important, because it bought uh, Nick Xerneas another free turn of damage, so it's a pretty interesting play, but we're going to see in um, game two here uh, Nick lead with Mimikyu and Xerneas as Arash is going to lead with Kangaskhan and Groudon. Uh, I mean, hard to say if it's a good adjustment yet already from Arash going with the Groudon. Turn one, because he didn't Mega Evolve his Kangaskhan, he was able to actually still go for a fake out into that Mimikyu due to its scrappy ability. And with Eruption, he's able to completely remove it and turn one, gain a Pokemon advantage. 
Uh, now with this Rayquaza on the field as well, it's kind of like a sticky situation, right? Like his Groudon's kind of pressured by the Rayquaza. His Kangaskhan, though, still threatens a roar onto this Xerneas, so he's still potentially able to roar it out. And that was kind of a, a great read, turn one, uh, from Arash, reading that Protect on Xerneas, as Kang is able to actually take a Life Orb Dragon Ascent, get off a double edge into this Xerneas for huge damage, go down, but you'd imagine that Xerneas protected last turn. This turn is going to be a double up into that slot as it goes down. And Arash taking the 3-2 to two Pokemon advantage. We have a Rayquaza that has minus drops. It looks like this is going to be a pretty quick match. I don't even know if he got to say anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely take that trade if you're Arash. You've not only removed Mimikyu, which is uh, a threat when you, that we saw with Sword Stance, but now you've removed the other boosting threat of the Xerneas, uh, thanks to some very good plays, but this eruption going to do a bit of damage to Rayquaza because he got the the uh, defensive drops. Um, Mamungus is going to hold on with the Sash as it's going to be able to put Incineroar to sleep, but even though, you know, Rayquaza normally has a good time with Groudon, but Groudon at full health with, you know, still the eruption pressure. Um, actually, well, if, if Rayquaza is able to outspeed this Groudon and get some good damage... Ooh, wait, that's a, that's a KO. Oh, yeah, I was completely, I was just about to say, like, you know, Rayquaza could just fire an Earth Power off, but, you know, this Xerneas probably able to take a hit from Rayquaza, probably just able to click Dazzling Gleam, and oh, oh it's another wow, away. you honestly hate I to see it, but wait a minute, the Incineroar, Incineroar wakes up, this. yeah, Incineroar Let's should be able to take this, crit. oh, yeah, Rayquaza's just going to go down the Life Orb recoil, and wow, that was a very scary situation for Arash there in the end game. Yeah, that was pretty terrifying, but you have to say from turn one, Arash played it, I mean, pretty much perfectly. With the turn one read, by reading the Protect on Xerneas, being able to completely remove the Mimikyu, I mean, from that point on, he was always going to be favorite to win this game as long as he was, you know, making the proper trades. And it also has to be said, even turn zero, team preview, he made a pretty good adjustment, deciding to lead just Groudon plus fake out pressure. I'm not quite sure how fast the Xerneas on this team is. I probably should be, to be perfectly honest. But if it's slower than the Groudon, then that, that eruption pressure is actually kind of terrifying. So leading Xerneas next to something like Mimikyu doesn't really give you the ability to fake out Geomancy, like Rage Powder Geomancy. Unlike like we've seen in the past where people usually decide to lead some support, as we see Nick do here in the first turn of three yeah we're gonna see the fake out going on to the amoongus here which is good for arash because it does break the sash here and prevent any potential poten potential spores turn one but we're just gonna see the Ze the geomancy trade here um Zernia's gonna go for protect on arash's side as light core correctly predicts that and goes for the moonblast into his kangaskhan just immediately removing that threat but groudon is gonna come in here uh it's i guess it's in a good position facing down an amoongus but this could be but of course, Lycor has to figure uh, has to uh, fear the switching into Rayquaza as Xerneas is still facing down with this dazzling gleam pressure. But also, not targeting an, into Groudon does mean a full power eruption, which Xerneas is, is yeah isn't going to mind too much. But Amoongus obviously going to drop to that as Rayquaza comes in. A special attack drop from Moonblast is kind of unfortunate because I mean it doesn't look like another Dazzling Gleam is going to be able to pick up the Xerneas, but the Nick Blast winning is. the speed tie because those Xerneas actually were speed tied wins and goes for the Moonblast straight into the Xerneas. And from this point on, I'm pretty sure that Rayquaza Xerneas on Nick's side is going to be able to sweep after he just double protects from this fake out pressure. He can just click Dazzling Gleam Earth Power and that should already be the end of this set with Nick. Yeah, these Xerneas the mirrors degree. have been going super fast. It's a lot to keep up with. These players have been clicking their moves pretty fast, and, you know, it's these, these games have just been going back and forth of who who Xerneas can outpace the other one. And I think Nick has definitely been getting fortunate here with these special attack drops and the speed tie wins. And, yeah, that combined pressure of Rayquaza plus Xerneas is going to be enough to take the match. GG's. GG's to Nick. Well played. Uh, I think Arash made a pretty good adjustment in game one. Game two, he decided to switch it back up and not lead the Groudon, which you can imagine if he had led the Amoongus and Xerneas into the Groudon Kangaskhan lead from Arash again, it could have ended pretty... I mean, 
not badly, but you can Nick's gonna be put on the back foot immediately turn one as compared to leading the Amoongus and Xerneas into the Kangaskhan and Xerneas. Um, but he's all around. Uh, it's it's always weird looking at the Xerneas mirrors, but typically whenever you have a Xerneas mirror, the support Pokemon is usually gonna decide uh or the the partner restricted is gonna decide. So has the matchup swayed in their favor? And Xerneas Rayquaza typically does have the matchup advantage against Xerneas Groudon. And the way that's usually dealt with uh, with the Xerneas Groudon teams is by leading that combination of Kangaskhan and Tornadus, like I mentioned earlier. But as we saw in Game 1, the Sash on the Amoongus, being able to take that Z-move, able to free up Xerneas, get up that free Geomancy after double protecting the stall at the fake out pressure. Yeah, it definitely came down to which support Pokemon was able to support the Xerneas better, and that's usually how these how these mirrors go. I think we are going to have another match to jump into here as Joe UX9 versus Marco Fierro is now in Game 3. Joe UX9 we know as the Radon Hero. Um, and we have uh, Marco Fierro here rocking in another X-Ray team, but this time he's got Gengar and Tapu Koko. Yeah, we're in turn three of this game right now, just catching up. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know, like, what sets any of them are running. I think Joe, does Joe were in Banded Rayquaza? Actually, his Rayquaza is gone. Yeah. It's hard for me to, like, catch up with this game. I think Joe only has the Groudon and the Crobat left. Yeah. Um, from his side, while Marco has... Does he only have Ray and Gengar left? Well, okay, or does he have see. another the, mom in the back? The Xerneas used Geomancy, and Coco Twinkle tackled it. And then, let's see, Groudon came in, Xerneas Dazzling Gleam KO'd the Coco. Uh, I mean, actually, I think in, in either case, I don't think it really matters. They think this game's over, right? Because the Crobat can't kill the Rayquaza on Marco's side, and the Rayquaza on Marco's side is able to just uh, lock down this Groudon. Oh, wait a minute. That Gengar, a, is, that Gengar just outsped Crobat. That's a Scarf Taunt Gengar. That's a Scarf Gengar, Marco. ladies and gentlemen, huh? Oh my goodness. So the taunt actually coming in clutch because you'd imagine if Crobat was able to set up Tailwind in that scenario, then the Cro then the, the Groudon would have been able to outspeed Rayquaza and since it has such low health, it'd be able to deal with it anyways. But in my head, I was just thinking that the Groudon can be locked down by Earth Power. And even if Crobat sets up Tailwind, he can get Earth Power as he switches to Incineroar, then the following turn fake out in Earth Power again. That's how I was thinking he was going to lock down the Tailwind option. Instead, I mean, Scarf Taunt Gengar can work as well. Yeah, that, that tech definitely came through in the endgame just to prevent any sort of win con coming out from Joe UX9. But again, we see, well, we didn't see, but, you know, the, we see through, this game ended on turn four, and this is Xerneas being set up on Marco's side definitely just steamrolled through all of Joe's answers for uh, the rest of Marco's team, so... You know, these these hyper-offense teams with Rayquaza and Xerneas just going head-to-head. -head. These games ten, tend to go by pretty quickly, so kind of wish we uh, got to see more of that set, but... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it just, go, it just goes by... These games are going by so quick, man. We just have these Xerneas mirrors, and it's just like... Um, lots of Rayquaza, too. And lots of offensive Rayquaza, too. So, you know, uh, these, Xer these Rayquazas out here just... KOing themselves the life orb recoil and just you know dropping their defenses allowing themselves to get KO'd more easily so really lightning fast games going on here typically how these zelda tours go is the earlier rounds things t uh, kind of are a bit snappy you know some players put timer on uh against against their opponents as well because it works in their favor uh generally if it's a player that likes to play quickly putting the timer on works in their favor so these matches normally fly by pretty quickly in the earlier rounds but once we start getting deeper in the tournament into the knockout stage that's usually when we see players slowing down taking those like one minute two minute three minute a turn so that they can think everything down since at that point in time there's just so much consequence to every single play that you make money on the line as i think this tour passed over four hundred dollars in prize money i believe solid prize pool yeah it's pretty good are there any other matches gone in this uh let's see uh, we could maybe slide into actually they're probably already playing their matches right now so it's probably 
probably not proper etiquette to DM them asking them to send us invites while they're in the middle of playing a match. Probably don't want to interrupt them. Yeah, I'll see if there's. Process. I'll quickly scroll through the matches that are happening right now and see if there's any ones that are not privated. But it looks like the ones that I'm clicking through right now are privated. Um, you could probably like go back. Uh, I don't know if you're still in the uh, in the room for Marco Fierro and Joe's games. We could like maybe go back and just like, replay uh, the match and stop turn by turn and just like analyze the matches or something like that, or just talk about the matches in general. Yeah, we can do that. I can pull up game one here. Um, and That's true. Because I think he invited me to all three games. So yeah, we have all of these up now. Is this wait? Which one's which? This one's game two. No, wait, this is game three. This is game one. And this is game two. Okay, so I guess we'll start. So game one took takes about 11 turns. So, you know, not as quick as the last game, but let's, uh, Joe UX9 looks like he take this one. And I guess we'll uh, see an instant replay here. I wish I could slow this down because now this is gonna go insanely fast. <laughs> You can just like pause it between like every single turn, I think. Yeah. So we're gonna see a Coco Crobat lead coming out from Joe UX9. Pretty ca pretty common lead from this team as Marco Fiero is gonna go with the Incineroar Xerneas, which uh, you know doesn't really like seeing Crobat that much because not only can Crobat not be faked out, but Xerneas does not like its uh like its boost being hazed away immediately. Yeah, you imagine that turn one for Joe. Just no matter what, he can just click tail with Crobat. One can't be stopped by fake out, and if the Xerneas decides to go for the Geomancy next turn, Kobat can still outspeed and go for a haze. He goes for the fake out and the Tapu Koko, and the yeah, others, the tailwind, and smartly for Marco decides not to Geomancy because if he does, it just gets wasted, right? Yeah. Uh, so he just tries to go for a fake out into the Coco, a little bit of damage, probably expecting the Coco to protect just in case it didn't. He probably still wanted to punish it anyways with the Dazzling Gleam. The Dazzling Gleam also gets a little bit of chip damage on Crobat, which I'm not sure how important the chip damage on Crobat is. Maybe it chips it into life, closer into life orb extreme speed range with two other combinations of attacks. I'm not quite sure on uh, the details of Crobat calcs, to be perfectly honest. But he, on turn two, he wants to get that Amoongus in, but does instead of his Incineroar, because obviously Incineroar and even Xerneas in this scenario both are kind of threatened by any form of Super Fang Z move. So you can imagine that's what uh, Joe's interested in going for. Instead, he wants to go for the Taunt Volt Switch, playing it safe, doesn't want to blow his Z move. And that's actually a fantastic turn for Joe, because not only does he he up the Xerneas to deny any potential Geomancy from coming out, but he's also able to Volt Switch to be able to get his Groudon into an amazing position here. So now he has Tailwind, so I'm going to stop Xerneas from getting any form of boost actually outspeeding Groudon. Even though we could haze them away, I think in general Taunt's a better play just because you can see this turn that because you have Tailwind up, your Groudon's the fastest thing. Since Marco doesn't have Kyogre, there's no way he can really stop an eruption or any fire move if that's what Joe is carrying. Switch breaks any potential Sash on Amoongus, so now he's free to just barrel, just barrel and fire off attacks, probably with Super Fang Eruption, and that's exactly what we see. Yeah, Joe was able to pretty much position himself in a way for Groudon to optimally sweep here. And the Coco switch in here is actually really good for him because that allows him to threaten the Ferium Z, which he actually does go into as the Amoongus switches in. But, I mean, Amoongus switching in, you know, it's still got to face down this full health Groudon. And even though uh, Joe is not in Tailwind anymore, this this Groudon can still kind of sit here and click buttons. And, yeah, yeah this Frail, this Xerneas, uh, this Rayquaza looks to be the frailer kind, so Dazzling Gleam is going to be an easy 2 KO. But this uh, eruption, yeah, Rayquaza without the Mega Evolution is also the uh, higher bulk, not able to take that eruption, and plus with the Sun Boost. Actually, no, it's not Sun Boosted because Airlock, duh. Um, but yeah, Xerneas going to uh, still be on the field here, but um, I think with Crobat in the back, um, yeah, Xerneas going to pick up those two KOs there, yeah. but I think with Crobat having the ability to negate this Xerneas' boost and Xerneas having, uh, not, not having a way to... KO this Crobat from where it's at. Uh, interesting play to protect there because, I mean, you kind of just let your haze, let the haze go off. Uh, you'd imagine that, if anything, your Wincon at that position is probably just going for a Moonblast into the Crobat, trying to crit it. Because um, I think that's probably, at that point, the only way you have to win the game. 
character from Amoongus is actually kind of huge here and kind of changes the entire dynamic of the matchup, to be perfectly honest. Because, I mean, not the entire dynamic of the matchup, but it, but it's big in general because normally Amoongus is expected to just get swept through by Groudon. So there's a couple of positions in this game where... Uh, or a couple of positions also in future games where you can imagine that Joe is in a position where he's just able to completely sweep through, but Amoongus being able to, to live that eruption, protect, or like try to pivot, get next to Xerneas, and still be able to, you know, take a grout on, still be on the field next turn for more redirection, say, with like an eruption, and then next turn be able to redirect uh, an attack from Rayquaza. I think he's actually kind of big for supporting a lot of the stuff on Marco's team especially in this matchup. But we can go ahead and hop in the game two and see how game two plays out. Yeah, at the same time, I I mean, Amoongus is kind of tricky to use in this matchup because it is facing a lot of oppression here from not only Tapu Koko being able to negate spores, Crobat being able to taunt it, Groudon just being able to one-shot it, barring the sashes broken with Eruption, and then Rayquaza, they can just drag an Ascent right into it. Um, but yeah, we're going to see similar leads here to game two as, uh, you know, Marco just going to not go for the Geomancy again. And... Uh, Crowback going to set up Tailwind again. Pretty much like a... I don't know if it's an exact replay of Game 1, or I think... In game 1, Joe went for the Protect on his Tapu Koko, which I think in this scenario is probably the objectively correct play. Like, you can't imagine like you wouldn't want to Protect and Tailwind here. Like, it just seems like it always benefits you. The only thing I can think of is that uh, Joe was maybe going for a read on Marco reading the Protect on Tapu Koko, so instead of going for the Fake Out Dazzling Gleam, uh, Joe thought that he was going to try to U-turn with his Incineroar, and so he was going to try to just maybe barrel off a Z-move into this Xerneas, a decent amount of damage off of it immediately. Uh, so that's probably what Joe was going for there, but, I mean, it, it looks weird just to, to see him take that free damage, but I think there's, you know, a decent a decent behind it. Um, uh, but now he's still in an amazing position where he can, you know, just barrel here with his Super Fang Z move as he goes into the Incineroar. And he's going to lose his Tapu Koko, which actually I think is a lot of good trade for him. Uh, because he Koko to deal with the opposing Rayquaza. Yeah. Um, um I mean, yeah, Koko definitely would have been a valuable asset to deal with this Rayquaza, especially since this Ferium Z is pretty much guaranteed to knock it out from full, since we know this Rayquaza is not carrying the Assault Vest, but... Letting Rayquaza take a lot of damage here, not really super great for Joe because, you know, that puts it right into extreme speed range. And now both these Pokemon are in extreme speed range, which allows, once this taunt runs out on Xerneas, like this pretty much, once this Crobat goes down, it's pretty much given a free reign to just Geomancy. And once that happens... Is that a double protect there? Wait, on on what? On the Rayquaza from Marco? Uh, yeah, it did actually get a double protect. Yeah, turn four. That's strange. Yeah, I got two protects. And he could just go for an extreme speed, right? Yeah, I guess he didn't want to... I guess the logic behind that play is that he didn't want to get any more damage in case he lost the extreme speed speed tie. Loses it, though. Then the Xerneas is still able to, to get off the Dazzling Gleam and yeah. the Rayquaza. And you imagine that Marco's Rayquaza is also important for dealing with this Groudon as well. I mean, I don't know what his last Pokemon is here, but... That should seem like a, kind of a weird situation to double protect. It seems like, if anything, like if you wanted your Rayquaza to stay safe that turn, you'd switch it out because you wouldn't want to risk the double protect failing and then gaining literally nothing on the turn, you know? Yeah. But I guess in the end... Yeah, Marco just won without even having to set up his Xerneas. That's crazy. Yeah, he's just able to get those Xerneas and the Rayquaza out on the field at the same time. And, you know, I mean, guess <laughs> without the... Without any of Joe's tools to remove that Rayquaza, it's just not... I don't even know what... Okay, yeah, so... Yeah, Marco just able to just position himself really well in the end game there. To realize that in that game, Marco Xerneas stayed on the field literally the entire game, like from turn one to the final turn. Didn't Geomancy once, just only clicked attacking moves, didn't protect once... And it ended the game also without taking any damage. Yeah. <laughs> it sat on the field the entire time, just clicking attacks. Didn't take any damage. Didn't go for any protects. Didn't go for any geomancies. Yeah, uh, I think round three is about to get started here, so we'll <clears throat> be right back once we pick a match, and uh, we will see you guys in round three. <laughs> 